This episode is sponsored by The Path, the coach-guided membership designed to help you make alcohol small and relevant in your life by removing your true desire to grab that next drink. Our science-based, compassion-led program allows you not only to shift your behavior and your relationship around alcohol, but more importantly, uncover and reprogram your subconscious conditioning and neural connections that have been keeping you stuck for years. With daily live breakthrough coaching, an intimate and supportive community, regular peer-to-peer connection calls, and a complete vault of resources, this is where your path to total freedom and effortless enjoyment of your new way of life begins. Join us at NakedMindPath.com. Hello, everybody. I'm Scott Pinyard, head coach of This Naked Mind, and I am here with a naked life story. And today I'm with Charlotta. How are you today, Charlotta? Thank you, Scott. I'm fine. I'm I'm, I'm doing excellent. <laughs> so, today. yeah, it's so good to talk to you. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that I love so much about this podcast is like, digging into people's histories and their stories. Like for me, and actually we were just talking about this before I hit record, listening to these stories, uh, lots of different people's stories and lots of different backgrounds was so inspiring to me. So I just want to say thank you, you know, for taking the time for this, because I think, uh, I think this will be really great for people. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> so why don't we dig in and we'll just start at the beginning with you. Uh, you know, all let's back up all the way to the beginning. You know, when was your first drink? How did your journey with alcohol get started? Well, actually i I have to start saying that I am from Sweden and I grew up in Sweden. I still live in, in Europe, but I still live in, in, in Austria. In Sweden, it's a little bit different, or it, it was. You can't buy alcohol. Uh, you have to get someone to buy it for you until you're 20, and you have to go to a special liquor store. So getting in the hands of alcohol was, you know, number one thing when you were a teenager. And I had my first, I was drunk the first time when I was 13. And uh, the wine, uh, as I was drinking, uh, I got it from my mother. She bought it for me. She was of this idea that, okay, I'd rather buy the wine for you and see see when you drink it. So uh, it's better to have you in front of me uh, than not knowing where you are or in which state. So that was her point of view, which I, of course, then uh, thought was great. I would... <laughs> Not understand it today. I mean, that was a yeah. completely different thing now. Uh, so that's how I began. And that's, I was not the only one because at that time, 13 is very young, but that's how it started. So Friday, Saturdays, going out, having party with my friends and um, drinking wine and smoking cigarettes. That's, that's uh, how my career started. And um, I have always sort of been like a, what do you call it? A happy drinker. It was, you know, party fun. Not that I was a party girl, but that was just a picture. Yeah. That was just the part of the picture, drinking uh, on, on with friends and going out and uh, having parties and uh, meeting up. That's how it went. So all through high school and um, when I was starting work at around my 20s, it was just something you did. It's just what you do. Relax, yeah. have a few drinks, have a, yeah. yes. Meeting friends that. and, yeah. So, uh, and as I said, it was like, not so, it is very expensive to drink as well in, in Sweden, a lot of taxes. So you have to, <laughs> it's like going, you have to have the money you have to have, you know, it was like a yeah. funny thing. So it was a little bit exciting also at that time, but, you know, starting working and then going out after work, having a beer or having a glass, uh, it's, it normally it was at that time this this is i'm going back now like 30 40 years when i was in my early 20s uh, it's like uh it was not so normal going out in the weeks uh the drinking almost always took place in the in the, on the weekends or on, on, on um, holidays or or when you were traveling somewhere but then again, it sort of started to be a little bit more European or a little bit more continent, as we say in Sweden. That that's yes. um, <laughs> yeah, new influences from you know having a glass of wine after work or at lunch or so. So, but I was actually, as I still consider it, a happy drinker until well, only the last ten years. Ten years mm. ago, I had some kind of a a dip in my life, I was going to, well, I, ha I, was, I had the opportunity to have a job that I was applying for. 
And uh, so I was working for 10 days or something, just like testing. I don't know what you call it in English. And um, they said that, um, well, I didn't get the job because they said uh, they don't like you here. And that was for me to hear that they don't like you. That was for me, like, wow. as a people pleaser, uh, as I yeah. was, um, that was devastating. And I think that was the turning point for me that when my drinking got sort of um, um, out of control or it was more and more and more. And I was also drinking secretly um, uh, alone, uh, kept it away from my husband. I moved to Austria like 15 years ago, 2005. So I've been living here with my Austrian husband now for 15 years or a little bit more. And um, it was like my thing to cope with the pain, I believe, of not being yeah. liked, not being, that was the start of, you know, uh, anyway, so, um, but, you but know, I'm guessing that wasn't like a switch, right? So it probably wasn't that like you heard that, you know, from that job interview 10 years ago, and then suddenly you're like, you're drinking a ton. My oh. guess is it was, did it ramp up over time? Like, talk to me about that. And like, what did that feel like as you were going through it? Because this, this part of the journey for so many people is not, we'll put it this way. We're not very aware of it. We're like aware that we're drinking more, but we're not aware of the whole ramification. So what was that like for you as you kind of started ramping up a little bit? Uh, it was definitely an escape to get away from um, the pain getting, it was mm -hmm. also sort of a reward to take care of myself, like self care. I need right. a glass. I deserve and, uh, this. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, coming back, uh, you know, it started by, you know, having a beer at 12 at lunch, uh, having two beers like a year later. It was just escalating, as you say. And then uh, after like six, eight years, it was like rushing from work to get home as soon as possible to get yeah. as much as possible into into you so and then also to prepare and make uh, uh <laughs> to you know brush our brush my teeth and everything before my husband came back so that i could you know be you know sober and and um, okay yeah so it was a lot of stress just the hiding the 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 secretly um drinking and the needs and uh i think it was um that was that was painful, but I'd never considered it painful at the time. I thought this was a nice thing. This was like, I'm doing this for me. It's like, um, I deserve this. But I mean, mm. yeah. Talk to me a little bit about the stress of hiding. So this is something I get so many questions about this mm -hmm. in our programs. You've probably seen it too in some of the programs you've been part of with us. Um, hiding is, is super common. And, um, can you talk to me? Have you, as you've kind of unpacked this, like, are you aware of like why you started doing that and how that all went down? Were there beliefs around it? Like, what was that like for you? I didn't quite understand it at that time more than I didn't definitely didn't want anyone to know that was, yeah. that was the first thing that nobody should know, and especially not my husband, right? <clears throat> because if he knew he'd probably leave me and and I think I'm still right about that. If I'd asked him today, he'd probably say, yes, I would. And um, so that was my number one, not for him to see and not for anyone else to know as well. I have best mm -hmm. friends in Sweden. They never knew that I was drinking that much. And uh, so it was like, uh, it was very important. It was like, I, I should hide this also. I don't know, from myself. I don't know, but it was like, I have to clean up. I will not have to, I can't show it to anyone. And if and this you, is those, you know, I've found this on my own journey, like drinking, a, it's almost like those drinks didn't count, right? So like I could, I could do this. I didn't have to explain myself to anyone. I didn't have mm -hmm. to, I don't know, account for it, mm -hmm. you know? But there's a loneliness that comes with that, you yeah. know, that I found at least. Yeah, definitely. It's like uh, I was feeling maybe I was feeling lonely in my in my relationship with my husband, and ironically, I, <laughs> I sat and drank alone 
to get away from the loneliness. So Weird how that works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, so it really doesn't work. But it's yeah. like, uh, it's like you say also, it's like, it doesn't really count. And it's just for me. And I'm a little bit, you know, yeah. a little bit crazy. Uh, I shouldn't be doing this, but still I'm doing it. So, um, but I've also found out later, um, as I have been walking this path and being in your group, in the Alive group and mm -hmm. the different programs on, on, on the path, that there is this voice in me that I have been had since a child and this is uh, something like uh, whatever you do never ever show your negative emotions because nobody mm. wants that nobody likes that is it just brings discomfort and uh, you shouldn't be doing that yeah so pain and sorrow sadness jealousy things that are nasty and ugly don't show it so i had to have a place for me where i could be with these feelings i suppose yeah. But that took me quite a while until I understood why I was doing it in this way. So. so you find yourself, you know, you're at this point now where you're hiding and you're drinking more than you want to. Are you happy? No. I realized that you can't go on like this. This is not good. I was aware that this was too much. Mm -hmm. But... Um, on Monday, you know, I, I'll start on Monday or I fix it uh, right. after this summer or after Christmas or. Man, do I know, understand this, that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So um, you're at that place. What happens next, right? What are the next sort of steps in your story? You find yourself there. Um, mm -hmm. What happens next? What happened next is that I, in, the, in September 2019, I met an old friend and I hadn't met her for many, many years. She lives in the south of France and we went there to meet a few uh, ladies and she said she wasn't drinking anymore and I was sort of what I mean <laughs> are you joking I mean who's yeah. not drinking uh, yeah. voluntarily and um but she was serious she wasn't drinking like two two or three years and I was so curious to find out what tell me more tell me everything you know about this and she told me about a book that she's been reading from Annie Grace and this snake in mind. And she said, this was, this was a game changer for me. And I'd give you the book. And I said, well, I know, I said, now what I'll know. Because I couldn't believe that when she was explaining, like, you know, it's about a mind shift, mindset shift. It's about, you know, picking up beliefs that you have in your subconscious and, and yeah. take them up and, and, and take a look at them and see if they're really true. And, and I was like, I, 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 I can't believe it. I can't believe that you have been doing this without suffering. Because to me, it was like giving up drinking is a lifelong struggle. Yes, miserable. Who would do miserable. it? Miserable. Why would you do it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, but she man. was sitting there in front of me and she was happy. And I said, boy. So I read the book in October 2019. And I was on the um, alcohol experiment, the 30 day uh, free um uh, experiment uh, from November 1st, 2019. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was like pressing a button. It was like, okay, November 1st, I stopped drinking. And it wow. was not a problem. I had no cravings no, and uh, I was working very, um, I did these, the, the prompts and the daily videos that was sometimes really, really good. A lot of journaling and um, that meant a lot to me. So the 30 days was like, and this was November. So when I said mid November, I said, I will not drink in for Christmas. December is also going to be alcohol free. And so I was alcohol free for six months mm. till April last year. So what did that feel like? I want to get to April in a second, but like, what did that, I mean, did you just wake up with a new brain? Like how, how did that, what did that, sh what was that shift like for you? This is one of the hardest things that I think a lot of people, like you just mentioned, like, it's hard to understand what it's like mm -hmm. to go through that mindset shift. So I'd love to hear you kind of describe it a little bit more. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's when you dig into the things with the questions that we have, uh, the reflections that when I start to think each day on you, new perspectives on, on my drinking, on alcohol, as it, it's like an education, 30 days education, very good education that yeah. I get to know things. And I get to think and question my own beliefs or my, my thoughts around, is it really like this? Is it really relaxation? And, yeah. and 
And I found out that no, it isn't. And I found no one ever questioned everything that I was thinking was wrong. And I was happily surprised. It felt like it was freeing to, to get all these answers so instantly, sort of. That's awesome. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was sort of an instant transformation. But of course, it didn't last. But it was like I was hooked from the, from the beginning. Yeah, and I, and I also have to say something. It was it's something in the book. It's, it's something in, about this naked mind that I also love so much. And I, I I decided from the very first moment, I trust this. I trust this process. I trust the information I got. I trust Annie Grace. I trust everything about what. And this is a decision, and I think this is very important to me because I said, okay, I give myself to, to this process, and uh, the outcome was was good. I, I love that. I love mm-hmm. that. And that's commitment, right? That's saying, like, hey, there's something here for me. I'm going to go for it. Yep. Um, that's so cool. So you're alcohol-free for six months, and then we get to April. Or we're in 2020 now, right? April of we're 2020. We're in last year, right. Yes. Like Let's talk two months of, of or one or two months of quarantine and COVID and sitting around my house uh, with, with a dog and husband 24-7. It's like, and yeah, um, yeah. I was not having cravings at all. I was not, I didn't want to drink, but it's just, I started to get, thoughts about drinking like associations you know i could actually have a glass of wine a glass of white wine isn't that really good okay and i was influenced and then it took me like i was i was struggling with this i had sleepless nights and i was thinking about drinking not wanting to drink but thinking about it yeah and then one day i had a glass of wine and uh, i it was like pressing the same button again but this time off it was like okay i was back it felt like i was completely back where i where i was before i quit wow. and that made me really depressed of course because I, it didn't taste I didn't like it but still I was you know sitting there in my backyard and my courtyard and and have this glass of wine or this bottle of wine I didn't drink as much as I used to but uh, I still was drinking and I didn't enjoy it. not one sip of it so when you look back at that so one of the things we like to talk about is this idea that people drink to run away from something or to run towards something. And you mm-hmm. kind of talk about the beginning of quarantine. And I saw so many people, my friends, family, I mean, almost everyone I knew. I mean, here in the States, right, we had, um, you know, closures and stuff a little bit later than you guys did, mm-hmm. um, except for what we call the essential services. And there were liquor stores were considered essential services. Mm-hmm. Um, So I saw this reaction all over the place, you know, people not knowing what to do. And of course, I mean, not that this is unprecedented, but certainly in modern times, an unprecedented thing to have basically the world shut down, um, which really kind of left us searching for this stuff. So at that time, if you can think back to April uh, a year ago, what were you running toward or what were you running away from? Do you have a sense of that? No, not really. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think maybe I was running to a place for me alone <clears throat> that I knew was a place that was only mine, that I had been like conditioned to think this is my place, drinking yeah. alone in the courtyard for 10 years, almost 10 years. Um, it could have been, it could have been like going the, to this place but I'm not sure. I have been thinking a lot. Was it boredom? Was it something else? But I just think that I was thinking so much about drinking. And so I did. Yeah. I had a glass of wine and then I was drinking for 10 weeks. Yeah. So it was not just a glass of wine. It was like a 10 weeks um, long pulse, as you would call it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting when we get to this point where we're, so you mentioned a place that I know, right? Like you're like locked in, can't go anywhere. Um, and this alcohol conversation comes up so much in those moments. Like I remember all of the memes and the conversations around, you know, um, oh, it's not that bad. I just bought a bottle of scotch, you know, that sort of stuff. And um, it's amazing how that can kind of worm our way, worm its way into our heads when we're, when we're feeling like penned in like that. Mm-hmm. So you drank 
starting an alcohol for about, or sorry, in April for about 10 weeks. Um, what was that like? And, and like, how did you decide to make the shift? Was it an emotional shift? Was it just a practical shift? Like, what was that experience like for you? I was very, um, I was, I was sad because I felt like a failure. Like, mm. Hey, you, you, you did it for six months and now what are you doing? I mean, yeah. how can you do that? I mean, you're yeah. a lot of judgment and like, um, and at that time, um, I began to have a lot of emails from this naked mind and talking about a new thing called the path. And I was sort of, okay, should I, because that was really important to me. The work I was after this uh, alcohol experiment, I was also doing the hundred days of mm-hmm. lasting change. And, uh, someone to hold to hold someone's hand is sort of important and I was lonely and uh, yeah so I got more and more interested in this information about the path that was going to be I think released on on June 1st or something so this was they just caught me or I was caught just in the right time so I thought okay I'll give it a try I was a bit skeptical because I some deep down I thought I will never do it again I will never stop drinking again so or had these feelings, but a little bit of hope because I was also thinking, you know, I did it once. So yeah, it I should be possible, you know, Yes, <laughs> yes. It again. so when I got on the path in June last year, I was drinking, but I was put in a group with people that had been just like me also had some time under the belt without alcohol. So, and I was feeling a little bit miserable in this group because I felt, well, I'm the, I'm probably the only one still drinking. Everybody's come so far, you know, this comparing and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. and the teacher or the, the, the teacher, the coaches, they said, no, Charlotte, you're exactly in the place we're supposed to be. And I was thinking, hell no, <laughs> not. I was sort of provoked, provoked by that because I, I'm not supposed to be drinking. So, but I understand now that those 10 weeks were really important to me so um at the end of june or something i gave up again and Mm -hmm. now i haven't been drinking for 10 months so i i I got over it and i have had so much help of this so this that was the um the turning point for me to get back on track as i say and it was just i was just saying okay june 22nd is your next date that's amazing mm -hmm. what can you talk to me like what is that what was that process like for you like what has the path been like for you I guess so you're in this group and you're like I don't know if I belong here you're still in it now we're talking almost a year later so what happened like what was that like for you first of all to have this hand to hold someone's hand and to meet all these other people in this group we're still sort of almost the same people uh about 20 people of us are the same people uh, from from that original group and uh, we, this community is so important that you have people in an environment that is completely judgmental free. That is, mm-hmm. that is number one, that is huge. That is really, <clears throat> really important to me that I can say anything. And uh, there are no harsh words, there are understanding or explain more, tell me more. And uh, we are really supporting each other. And, and that is that is really awesome, and then the content in the um, the content that we've had in the alive group that um, we were together with also new people coming into the group, uh, and uh, that was mind blowing because then we were sort of post alcohol. Alcohol was not no longer the number one topic. It was a little bit smaller, a little bit more irrelevant in our lives. So. We start to think about and have urging, wanting to know things that were beyond alcohol or maybe before alcohol. I don't know. What yeah. Things that maybe brought us to drink the way we did. And uh, those months in the path, they were really mind blowing in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. So what is life like now? Life now is I have changed things not only physically uh that the first thing is like super super quality sleep and uh and things like that and um but i am a lot more i am not nicer today i am friendlier i am not so irritated or grumpy as i used to be for you know bullshit things 
And uh, yeah. I think I'm a lot more open and friendly uh, with my husband and with other people, more interested in things. And this is exactly where I want to be. And uh, I have learned to, to take those steps to, to move forward, to, to be in a place where I am feeling this is okay. You are okay. And mm -hmm. this is how I want to feel. And I'm in, I'm in progress and my life is in progress until I die. And this is super interesting. And I am really excited about it being here and moving forward because I'm not standing still. Yeah. So what does the future look like for you now, after this year, after this entire journey from 10 years ago, what's next? You know, funny that you ask. I, I will probably uh, lose my job now <laughs> in, this, in this year. Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, COVID and everything, my husband, I'm working sure. with my husband and he is probably uh, ending his company. He's also going to be retired in a few years. So. I am actually thinking of, of joining the coach or applying for the coach to the Snake and Mind coach program next year. Well, I know the guy who reviews the applications and I oh, you know say, he's, okay. really, he's really tough. He's really <laughs> tough. <laughs> well, maybe you can put in a good word for me. <laughs> I will try. I will try. <laughs> now, I think that would be, that would be uh, something special. I would love to, this is just dreaming. I would love to work with the Swedish market. Yes. Um, the, the need is uh, big. The need is big everywhere. And it, what I find is that, so we have coaches now, like we're in the middle of training a group of coaches. Um, we're finally, we're training our first German coach and we're training a couple of coaches in France. And, you know, a lot of our coaches have been the US, the UK and Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always so exciting to me when I see people who want to bring this to different languages. I have a coach who lives in Greenland, but, you know, does a lot of business in Denmark. And mm -hmm. like, to me, that's so exciting um, yeah. because there are just going to be things that, yeah, I mean, obviously, if with your background that you're going to know and understand about that culture that I don't get. It's the same reason that, you know, in England, everyone's like, wow, you're so enthusiastic because they're a little bit more reserved. And yeah. <laughs> that's just a minor version of this. So yeah, yeah. I have to say, I think that would be a fantastic direction for you. I think that would be so, so cool. Thank so <laughs> talk to me about like, what is day to day like now, right? We've kind of talked about the bigger things, but you've, you know, you've changed your relationship with alcohol. You've gotten into this place where you've grown um, through being in the path. What is, you know, what's it like to wake up on a Monday for you now? Well, we're still in, we're still in COVID. I'm still laid off from work. So I mm -hmm. don't work every day as I did before. Uh, everyday life is like, I still go up very early. I get up at six o'clock and, uh, I have my breakfast and then I do my work and my work is the path. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, I, I just call it now personal development because it could also be reading books. It could be uh, listening to podcasts. It could be anything. It could be meditation. It could be things like uh, things that I didn't do two years ago, one and a half year ago. I have started with yoga last year in the summer, which I was just talking about, talking, 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 but never got into so I'm <laughs> yeah. doing yoga uh, a couple of times a week I have been um, experimenting with um, to expand my my exercise my movement uh, you know, training I have I have one functional training that I do a couple of times a week and now yoga and I am actually a, um, a couch potato but I actually bought a pair of jogging shoes running shoes That's because so I have learned in this uh, program that you can hold things loosely and you can take baby steps and you can do things just to make you feel good so i have a little program now. this is my april program i go running once a week this is a minimum once a week for 10 minutes That's, because i, I take love a walk that every day <laughs> i take a walk every day but once a week i want to jog or run for 10 minutes now the last couple of weeks it has been like 30 minutes and uh this I do, and I also have a cross trainer that has been just standing and collecting dust for the, for the last few years, but I am using it the same 10 minutes every week and uh, just to see where it takes me. And this is so funny because I think it's really, really boring to, to, to jog or to do cross training. <laughs> but when I can decide it's okay to do 10 minutes or 12 minutes or 13 minutes or, or yeah. 40 minutes, 
and I can stop whenever I feel like it. Nobody's telling me, it's just my own feelings. And that is, that is so awesome that I decide based on my feelings, no, I have enough. No, I can run for a little longer. So uh, I love that. I am I doing. That. <laughs> it's so empowering to look at it that way right? Like how many people start this off and they're like, I'm going to start, you know, here in the States, you probably have something similar over there. We have something called the couch to 5k program where it's like, you have this like regimented thing that you have to follow. And like the running times get longer and longer and longer. And it really has nothing to do with how you feel. Mm -hmm. It's just what this program says you could do. And Mm -hmm. people set themselves up for failure so often because they're like, oh, this is getting long. I don't like this. And then they quit because it wasn't enjoyable. And then they beat themselves up. So mm-hmm. it's so empowering to be like, you know what? I'm going to run as long as I want to. Maybe it's yep. 10 minutes. Maybe it's 20 minutes. I'll go crazy and do 25 minutes. You know, like yeah. <laughs> I, it's so good. So how does that yeah. feel? Like, how does that feel when you actually get through one of those runs? That feels great, of course, because I'm feeling, yes, I'm on my, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. I'm doing something that fits for me, that suits me. This yeah. for, for me, because I don't need to do it for anybody else. And I don't need to listen to people saying, hey, if you don't run uh, at least so and so fast or so and so a lot of pulses, I don't know what they're talking about. But because like, no, I'm just doing it for me. And I'm doing it for 10 minutes or more or less. But this is how I want to do it. And I don't care what other people say, how I should be doing it or how I should not be doing it. Because everybody's also thinking that you're doing it to lose weight. And this is not the reason why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I want to experiment with new physical movements. And maybe I lose a few pounds. Could be. That's amazing. I love it. Um, so we're just about out of time, but I want to ask you a question um, that I, we really like to ask people on these, these episodes. Um, so if you could go back in time, maybe to 10 years ago, right. When you said things really ramped up for you drinking wise, and you could tell the Charlotta of that time, one thing about what life is like now, what would you tell yourself? Have faith. It is going to be so much better than you can ever dream of. Um, life without alcohol is 10 times, 100 times better. And um, you will make it. Believe in yourself, trust in yourself, trust in this naked mind, because that was important to me. I have to say it again. And uh, you will make it. And you will see that it is a new dimension in your life. And uh, you will be happy to know that, hey, I still got the rest of my life before me. And I I have the possibility to, to... create my own future in the way I want it. That is amazing. That's an incredible message. Um, Charlotta, anything else you want to share before we wrap it up? Is there anything else you're thinking or want to just say to anyone that might be listening who's in sort of on this journey? Uh, no, that I'm just that I'm very, very happy and grateful for, for the program, for being here and for the work that it has made me do with me, with myself and together with the friends that I've made. And um, this is really awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for spending your time with me today. It was great to catch up with you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) And thank you to all of you listening out there. We'll be back again soon with another Naked Life story. Take care. Hi, it's Annie Grace. I wanted to interrupt this podcast. I guess the end of this podcast to say that if you're totally serious about actually and truly and forevermore transforming a relationship with alcohol, really leaving it behind in the rear view mirror for once and forever and changing your psychology about it, we have a program called The Path that I've created specifically for you. Now, it's not for you if you're still dabbling or trying to figure out where you want to be or maybe even if you still want to moderate. All those things are fine. That's great. But if you're beyond that and you're like, no, I just want to be done with this. I'm ready to invest some time and I'm ready to just make this happen. I want the answer. I want the easy way out. Then I want you to check out NakedMindPath.com and join us in the path where you receive coach guided and community support so that you can truly make this lasting change that you want in your life. And as always, Rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.